Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Judith Sears Poisson, and I'll be your host. The topic of this webinar is Interrupting Intergenerational Poverty, New Research and Recommendations for Policy and Practice. The information shared today comes from a recently released report by a committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and we're fortunate to have four members of that committee with us today. First, we'll hear from Dr. Greg Duncan, who is a distinguished professor in the School of Education at the University of California, Irvine, and also an IRP affiliate. He'll provide an overview of what the generational poverty topic is and why it matters, the scope of the committee's work, some findings, and an explanation of the committee's evidence standards. Then we'll hear from Dr. Michael R. Strain, the Arthur F. Burns Scholar in Political Economy and Director of Economic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He's also an IRP affiliate, and he'll explore the drivers of intergenerational poverty and program and policy ideas to break the cycle. Next, Dr. Mary Patillo will share insights into the racial and ethnic dimensions of intergenerational poverty and what the committee found using that lens. She's the Harold Washington Professor of Sociology and Chair of the Department of Black Studies at Northwestern University. And then as we move into the Q&A session, Dr. Rita Hamad will join the discussion. She's an Associate Professor of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard University. This webinar is supported in part by funding from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. But views expressed by our speakers don't necessarily represent the opinions or policies of that office or of any other sponsor, including the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We have an hour today, and after we hear from each of our presenters, we'll spend the last 15 minutes or so for a live Q&A. You can type questions through the Q&A box. We did get quite a few questions submitted as people registered, so we'll also be queuing some of those up as well. I want to let you know that we have closed captions enabled, so you can toggle those off on or off at the bottom of your screen. And we will be posting the slides and the recording of the webinar within a day or so, so you'll re receive a link to those by email. We also just released a podcast episode with another member of this NAS committee, Dr. Jesse Rothstein, in which we talked specifically about K-12 education and the earned income tax credit. We'll drop a link to that interview in the chat here, as well as a link to the NAS report. So with that, thank you again for being here, and we'll get started with Professor Greg Duncan. Thanks, Judith. And uh, thanks to IRP, and thanks to everyone for uh, joining us, a wonderful uh, group. So. I would like to just give a little um, introduction here. Um, in 2021, uh, Congress asked the National Academy of Sciences to uh, study intergenerational poverty. Uh, and when the National Academy receives these requests, they put together a uh, committee to carry out the task. Uh, they negotiate a statement of task with the sponsor. Uh, there are some other sponsors as well. Um, and uh, and then they uh, provide staff support and a lot of staff support. Uh, we're very grateful for that to uh, actually do the work of the committee. It took us a couple of years to uh, to do the work. So let me start in uh, first by showing you on the next slide uh, the committee members. Uh, it's a very diverse set of uh, committee members in terms of discipline, in terms of academic and think tank and uh, community organizations. Uh, divergent political dispositions. So the whole idea is to get uh, 14 very different people sitting around a table uh, to agree on um, what uh, is a consensus report. Uh, at the end of the day, everyone has to sign off on every word of the report. So this is a, this is a consensus report. Um, next slide, please. This is the statement of task and uh, Committees are asked to address all the elements of the statement of task uh, and nothing that's not in the statement of task. Uh, so what's in the statement of task? First, uh, to identify key drivers of long-term intergenerational poverty. Uh, second, uh, to identify evidence-based policies and programs um, that uh, have the potential to reduce intergenerational poverty. Um, third element is to evaluate the racial and ethnic disparities and structural factors that help perpetuate intergenerational poverty. Uh, and then finally, uh, talk about research and data needs. Um, so our report came out uh, in September. Uh, it's available free. I think uh, Judith is putting the link up. So let's get into it. Next slide, please. 
Um, the definition that we uh, came up with is a very straightforward one. Intergenerational poverty is a situation in which children who grow up uh, in families with incomes below the poverty line are themselves poor uh, when they're adults. So we first tried to get an idea of what the scope of intergenerational poverty is. Uh, next slide. We were able to draw on um, committee member uh, Roz Chetty's work uh, using IRS tax records uh, on the entire population. So uh, they covered um, everyone as well as subgroups of the population. Uh, and we started out by just saying how, how widespread is intergenerational poverty. Among children growing up, in households with low incomes. These are kids born around 1980. Um, they're tracked uh, through their childhood, so you know what their family income was uh, during childhood. Uh, this is defining uh, low income as the bottom 20% uh, of families, of children living in families. So uh, low income in childhood, and then you can follow these kids in the records uh, into adulthood and see between ages 30 and 39, in this case, uh, what fraction are uh, poor as adults. So you can see what their family income is during those age ranges. Uh, and again, draw the line at the bottom 20%. Um, and uh, could you back up one slide, please? I was gonna, there we go. Uh, no, 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 oh, there we go, okay. Um, overall, you find that of children who grow up in low-income households, 34%, uh, are also poor in adulthood. Um, 30, you know, when I give a give this um, seminar, uh, I ask before I reveal this number, uh, what numbers people would guess, and they typically guess that 50, 60, 70 percent of uh, poor kids are poor in adulthood. Um, so the good news is that that actual figure is uh, considerably less. Um, many of them don't go that far above the, uh, the low income threshold, um, but there is a substantial amount of mobility, um, although uh, people who start out poor are much more likely to be poor in adulthood than people who don't start out poor. But striking, uh, next slide please, uh, is the demographic uh, differences in this rate of poverty persistence. 34% um, overall, uh, it's half that for Asian kids. Um, Latino kids have about the same rate of intergenerational poverty persistence as whites. We were a bit surprised by that. Uh, but both Black and Latino and uh, Native American kids uh, have considerably higher rates of intergenerational poverty persistence than other groups. So the report spends quite a bit of time uh, on those two groups. Next slide, please. Um, we, we wanted uh, next to turn to the the findings about the key drivers of intergenerational poverty and the programs and policies to address them. Uh, next slide, please. The statement of task uh, directs the committee to identify key drivers of long-term intergenerational poverty uh, and most importantly, identifying programs and policies for which there is strong evidence uh, that they will reduce multi-generational poverty. So this, um, this uh, element of strong evidence, uh, the committee took very seriously. Uh, and next slide uh, provides a little schematic of what we considered to be strong evidence of effectiveness for programs and policies directed at poor children today who that would reduce their chance of being poor uh, in adulthood. So we decided to be fairly strict in our evidence standard, uh, focusing on direct evidence uh, where a program or policy evaluation uh, was sufficiently long-term that it tracked kids who received benefits from a program or policy uh, into adulthood to try to see uh, evidence that they had completed more schooling, that they were um, healthier, that they had committed fewer crimes, all the correlates of uh, long-run poverty. So for example, uh, there, are, there are a number of studies of uh, supplements, to, uh, state supplements to the Earned Income Tax Credit Program. Um, and uh, there's been good research that kind of takes advantage of the fact that kids are spending different amounts of time uh, in states that have uh, higher or lower supplements. Uh, and what they find is that kids who uh, 
benefit the longest from supplements uh, or enjoy the, the most generous supplements um, complete more schooling, uh, are less likely to be poor in adulthood. Um, so that's, that's a good example of direct evidence. Uh, and we limited our, uh, our A list of programs and policies to, uh, to those programs and policies that met that standard. There are a lot of programs and policies that, uh, next slide please, that uh, didn't meet the standard and perhaps many are quite worthy. Um, there were a lot of programs and policy uh, evaluations that um, have short run evidence, you know, tutoring for example, uh, high, high intensity tutoring programs uh, have been shown in rigorous studies to uh, boost uh, test scores for a couple of years, but we really don't know. And test scores probably are associated, well, they're certainly associated with long run improvements, but whether they cause long run improvements, uh, we don't know. So that's a, that means uh, indirect evidence, short run gains, but not the kind of long run evidence that we're going to be concentrating on. So with that, let me uh, turn it over to Michael Strain, who's going to talk about uh, the driver and uh, program and policy evidence that we've got. Thank you, uh, Greg. Um, I'm going to talk, as Greg said, about the drivers and, and, and evidence, uh, which is um, a, a tall task to do in 12 minutes, um, but I'll try to offer a comprehensive overview and uh, kind of something of a flavor of, of what we were looking for. So we identified seven potential drivers that are here on the screen, uh, children's education, uh, children's health, family structure, uh, housing, neighborhood safety and criminal justice, um, child mal maltreatment and child welfare issues, uh, and uh, family income and wealth and parental employment. So um, the kind of home environment of the child the parents' employment status um, and you know various uh, services like education and health that influence uh, children's outcomes as children, and they can go on to influence their outcomes as adults. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, this afternoon we'll highlight these uh, these five. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide, please. We'll start with education. It's well known the association between uh, higher uh, levels of education and higher uh, earnings. This is uh, relevant to this report um, in terms of the the parents' education level and the and the earnings and income of the household in which uh, the child is raised. Next slide, please. Um, there are large gaps in school achievement. Uh, you see a large gap between whites and Asians um, that actually that actually reversed over over the uh, 25 years that are shown in this graph. A big gap between kind of whites and Asians at the top and uh, Latinos, Blacks, and Native Americans down at the bottom. Uh, these are eighth grade reading proficiency rates. Next slide, please. So we identified policies that uh, that can. Um, uh, that can boost child's educational attainment, uh, children's educational attainment, and then and, and that that in turn uh, uh, meet the evidentiary standard that Greg uh, described for reducing uh, rates of intergenerational poverty, um, increasing K through 12 school spending in the poorest districts uh, is one example in the K through 12 uh, space, um, tutoring, case management for post secondary. Uh, more effective uh, in expansions of effective financial aid programs for low-income students. Um, and then in the uh, kind of more adult training space, um, uh, uh, occupational training programs uh, for adults uh, and also for, for youth. Next slide, please. Uh, income and employment, next. Next slide. Um, so here we show a graph of average household income uh, measured in uh, 2021 dollars, and you see substantial, uh, well, you see increases for all three groups we have here, the bottom quintile, the middle quintile, and the top quintile, um, but uh, incomes at the top grew substantially more over this period than incomes uh, at the middle or than incomes at the bottom. Next slide, please. Uh, a uh, policy that we uh, recommend um, 
to reduce intergenerational poverty or a policy that we found uh, that reduces intergenerational poverty is the earned income tax credit. The earned income tax credit uh, has been shown to increase participation uh, in the workforce, to increase uh, self-sufficiency uh, uh, and to increase household income. And so it has uh, the kind of direct effect of, of boosting income because it's an earning subsidy only available to workers. Um, and then also has uh, uh, benefits that once people are in the workforce, they can they can work toward uh, work toward self sufficiency. Next slide, please. Uh, health, um, an important driver of intergenerational mobility. Uh, we present evidence that children in low income families have worse health uh, than other children. Uh, that this that these health disparities begin before birth and they increase throughout uh, childhood. Um, and uh, we identify um, both uh, access to healthcare services uh, as an important driver, also broader environmental factors like uh, exposure to pollution as an important driver of intergenerational uh, mobility. Next slide, please. So here we recommend uh, expansions of family planning services uh, and uh, expansions of health insurance. I think one of the things that we that we identify is that uh, continuous access is really important, um, and uh, and we stress that in the, in the report. Next slide, please. Uh, on nutrition, we we uh, recommend expanding access to the SNAP program um, uh, for legal permanent residents and for and for uh, and for undocumented parents, uh, and we uh, uh, recommend. Um, efforts to uh, uh, reduce pollution, to increase uh, air quality, including indoor air quality. There's uh, uh, one of the things I learned in working on this report is just how strong the quality of the evidence is about, about pollution. Um, next slide, please. Crime, um, neighborhood safety uh, is uh, shown to affect um, intergenerational uh, mobility. Um, we document in the report that low-income and younger people are most likely to report being victims of crimes in their neighborhoods and schools. Uh, and this graph shows uh, death rates among children and adolescents. Uh, and you see an increase in drug overdoses, an increase in, uh, in poisoning, an increase in firearms, um, uh, big reductions in motor vehicles, and no real uh, uh, increase in, in deaths related to cancer. Next slide, please. Um, we uh, recommend um, that, uh, 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 well, we document that um, juvenile detention, even for very short periods of time, has long-term negative consequences on educational attainment uh, and on economic outcomes. Um, and that that's true for both violent and nonviolent offenders. Next, next slide, please. And so we uh, recommend uh, really scaling back the use of juvenile uh, confinement uh, only to those who pose a serious and immediate risk to public safety. Uh, and we recommend um, measures to uh, make neighborhoods safer, expanding the use of community policing, expanding funding for policing and high crime, neighborhoods, um, uh, among other recommendations. Next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, recommend measures to reduce uh, gun violence um, uh, and um, uh, uh, investing in children. Um, there's interesting evidence around the Becoming a Man program, uh, uh, so-called therapeutic uh, interventions. Question is how to scale these up, um, but uh, but there was some there was some you know good promise there. Next slide, please. In housing, uh, we uh, uh, recommend promoting residential mobility, um, expanding coverage of the housing choice uh, voucher program, um, and having uh, uh, what in a labor market context would be described as wraparound services. Customized, customized counseling and case management services uh, to help uh, people to move um, 
uh, uh, in low poverty neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Um, we uh, had a lot of debate about family structure. Um, and uh, I think the language we put in the report was that um, that uh, that family structure uh, was uh, the evidence uh, the, uh, of the link between family structure and intergenerational mobility out of poverty was strongly subject strongly suggestive of of a causal link. Um, but uh, you know, obviously not an airtight RCT because that's very hard to do. Uh, it was impossible to do uh, for for family structure, um, and we uh, uh, in the report argue that there's no real uh, evidence of any programs or policies that can address family structure issues, and we thought that it was important to to um, spend a little time on in this presentation that even though uh even though you know nothing can be nothing nothing has been proven to be uh to be effective um at addressing family structure issues uh that um that uh you know that that fact itself needs to be highlighted uh as a way of demonstrating the broader point that increasing uh intergenerational mobility out of poverty is a really difficult thing for public policy to do um next slide please uh these are just statistics on on uh, child poverty rates by by family structure next slide please oh and uh that's it for me uh i think i was supposed to do it in 10 minutes and i did it in 10 minutes and 15 seconds you you set the bar high michael <laughs> Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will be talking a little bit about racial and ethnic disparities. Can everybody hear me? Because I, on my screen, I'm not up yet. There we go. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So the sponsors of the study who framed the statement of task rightly anticipated that racial and ethnic disparities in intergenerational poverty would be a salient issue. And the data that Greg presented to begin shows that that is the case. So we build on that basic finding and we follow the statement of task by analyzing the literature on key drivers of poverty across generations and the evidence on the effectiveness of programs to uh, address those determinants. So I will note that we focus on black and native Americans uh, given the identified patterns that Greg showed in the beginning um, it's important to say that Latinx children have rates of intergenerational poverty and mobility that are similar to white children, and Asian American children have lower rates of intergenerational poverty. Um, the research that Chetty has done with colleagues points out that really the um, exceptional outcomes for low-income Asian American children are really driven by first-generation immigrants. So the immigration, um, that the fact that um, immigrant Asian children are much more upwardly mobile than our native born Asian American children is really driving that pattern for uh, Asian American children, but it's not driving the pattern for Hispanic children. Um, nonetheless, at the uh, general level, Asian American and Hispanic children have intergenerational poverty rates very similar to white children. And so we focus on black and native American children also because not because Latinx and Asian American children don't experience or, or, or that Latinx and, Latinx and Asian Americans have not experienced racism in the United States, but rather the kind of longstanding uh, intergenerational exposure is peculiar in particular for black and native American families. Next slide, please. So as we think about the statement of task, it really required us to look historically and to review the various practices of impoverishment uh, that have been experienced by Black and Native Americans as represented by the taking of land, the taking of labor, and the taking of cultural resources. Um, so we show using the evidence that exists how these historical actions have effects today. And I'll just give three examples, even though there are two on the screen, I just had to sneak, uh, sneak another one in. For example, the Dawes Act of 1887 allotted Native American lands for private ownership or to be held in federal trust 
which created what's often called a fractionated land tenure on Native American reservations. And so that was 1887. If you look at present day effects of this law, researchers find that Native Americans who live on reservations that feature this fractionated land pattern have lower per capita income than their counterparts on reservations that are less fractionated. And so put more plainly, this 19th century policy of land expropriation, the privatization of land that had been um, where Native Americans had, um, had lived, uh, is correlated with economic well-being of Native Americans in the 21st century. The literature on these long-term effects of historical events is continuing to grow. So our uh, um, report was published in the fall of 2023, and at that same time, a new paper by Don Fair and colleagues was published in the Review of Economic Studies that I just found to be fascinating. And it showed that the mass slaughter of the bison um, in the Western United States, which was the result of U.S. expansion, settlement, high tanning technologies and military action in the late 1880s drastically reversed the fortune of the Native American nations that had depended on the bison for generations, for their survival and for their flourishing. The authors show and uh, write, quote, once amongst the tallest people in the world, the generations of bison, bison re reliant people born after the slaughter lost their entire height advantage. So height, of course, is one measure of economic well-being, but they show also that later generations were less likely to be employed and had lower per capita incomes than the descendants of Native American groups who were not reliant on the bison. I'll give one more example now focusing on Black Americans. Uh, in the 1921 Tulsa race massacre, as many as 300 Black people were killed and roughly 35 acres of the Greenwood section of the city of Tulsa, which had been called Black Wall Street for its concentration of thriving Black-owned businesses, um, those 35, nearly 35 acres were burned to the ground. This event sent a message to Black folks in Tulsa and across the country that their socioeconomic upward mobility could be met with violence at any moment. And researchers have found that the Tulsa riots lowered the occupational status of Black, Black Tulsans into the 1940s, again, 1921 Tulsa race riots, so 20 plus years later, and it lowered their home ownership rates through the year 2000, or 80 years after the event. It also lowered the home ownership rates of Black people outside of Tulsa, particularly in cities where Black people received extensive news coverage of the violence. So the ripple effects are not only forward in time, but outward in geography. Um, the report includes several other examples of historical policies, practices, and events, such as redlining of Black neighborhoods or the forced removal of Native American children to boarding schools, that have documented long-term socioeconomic outcomes or effects, sorry. Next slide, please. Um, the committee also looked at those same drivers that Michael presented and um, looked at them specifically for ways in which those drivers showed racial disparities um, and may be contributing to the racial disparities in um, intergenerational poverty. So I will focus just on three today. So in the realm of education, Black and Native American students are disproportionately subjected to harsh school discipline from very early ages. In preschool, for example, Black toddlers are suspended at two and a half times their representation in the preschool population, and Native American toddlers are suspended at one and a half times their representation. Exclusionary school discipline leads to lost learning days. For example, the Civil Rights Project at UCLA finds that Black students lost 103 days per 100 students enrolled, and Native American students lost 54 days per 100 students enrolled. And whereas that compares to, to, to only 21 days of lost school time for their white peers. 
So if you're not in school, you can imagine that these lost learning opportunities uh, mean that harsh school discipline is found in both correlational and quasi-experimental studies to be related to things like lower standardized test scores, uh, lower high school and college graduation rates, and increased chances of involvement in the criminal legal system as adults. In the realm of housing and neighborhoods, a 2021 study found that apartment seekers with black identified names were 9.3% less likely than white renters to receive a response. Um, this author shows that greater, greater housing market discrimination is correlated with greater residential segregation and with larger white black gaps in intergenerational income mobility. We also know that concentrated neighborhood poverty shows disparities by race. Roughly 30% of black and native American children compared to 4% of non-Hispanic white children live in neighborhoods that feature high poverty. And we know that growing up in high poverty neighborhoods and in counties with greater concentrated poverty and racial segregation is correlated with lower intergenerational poverty. I actually saw that was already one of the early questions in the, in the chat. So yes, we discussed this in the report, this correlation between racial segregation and lower intergenerational mobi mobility. And in the criminal legal system, Black and Native American children have greater rates of exposure to community violence, which increases their likelihood of school dropout, their likelihood of offending as young adults, and reduces performance on standardized tests. So those are just ways that those drivers um, affect outcomes. I see we've already gotten to the next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about promising policies and programs. So many of the policies and programs that we identified have specific uh, positive impacts in closing this, these racial disparities and intergenerational poverty. So next slide, please. Uh, we identified these 12 policies and programs um, that close this gap for Black children only. There are no studies that evaluate the effectiveness for Native American children. And indeed, when we talk about research gaps, we um, show that one of the important new research that some of the important new research that needs to be done is including Native Americans in research, especially longitudinal research on policies and programs that might uh, positively impact Native American families. So just a few examples. In the education space, research by Rucker Johnson shows that increased school funding is one of the mechanisms by which school desegregation improves long-term outcomes for Black students. He finds that students who were exposed using a court order desegregation rulings, the timing of those desegregation rulings and sibling data he finds that students who had 12 years of exposure to a desegregation ruling experienced per pupil spending that was 22 and percent greater than students who were not exposed to such a court order. We really point out this mechanism of uh, why and how school desegregation works because we think mechanisms are really important. And you will see on this slide, there's one other um, there's another intervention that we find positive evidence for, and that's the positive effect of Black teachers on Black students' long-term outcomes, especially the long-term outcomes of Black boys. So this might seem to go in the opposite direction of our desegregation finding, uh, since Black students matched with Black teachers might suggest a predominantly Black school. But here again, we wanna point out the importance of mechanisms because the authors find that these positive effects of black teachers appear to be generated by some combination of role modeling, fewer disciplinary actions and higher teacher expectations. So while the role modeling effect may not be replicable, but we might not be able to replicate that for non-black teachers because the role modeling is having a black teacher and showing what can be done as a black person, the other two, reducing harsh discipline and increasing expectations can be carried out by teachers of any race. And so mechanisms are really important for thinking about these interventions. There are several others that I won't expand upon now. The Clean Air Act of 1970, 
um, reduced racial disparities and exposure to particulate matter, and that's super important for long-term outcomes for poor children. Expanding Medicaid access um, improves life expectancy among Black children and reduces disparities. Reducing juvenile intent detention uh, um, affects completed schooling and adult crime for Black youth. And the EITC expansion shows positive effects on the educational attainment and earnings of Black children and later in life. So there are multiple ways uh, to intervene in these racial gaps in intergenerational poverty. Next slide, please. Oh, those were just some other things that I was talking about. Uh, so those show, are shown there. Thank you. The next slide, please. Um, finally, our final part of the statement of task was to identify key high priority gaps in the research. I have already mentioned one, which is the dearth of um, information about intergenerational poverty and po policies and programs for Native Americans. Um, next slide, please. And we have a number of others. Um, so we suggest that funders prioritize strong, long-term research designs. One of the big hurdles that we had was that there's a lot of short-term evidence, not a lot of long-term evidence, not that direct evidence that Greg mentioned at the top of the presentation. So scaling up versions of successful models that might sh uh, show short-term evidence and following over long periods of time will help get at this question of how to reduce intergenerational poverty. Um, and then we also want to uh, focus on research that uh, on specific communities that are at the highest risk. So that includes Black and Native Americans, but of course might include other populations like uh, single parent families or things along those lines. Um, and then the next slide, please. Uh, we definitely want to um, emphasize uh, data linkage projects, access to administrative data, and um, the possibility of having access to IRS data while obviously preserving confidentiality. And then our final slide uh, thanks our study sponsors who made this study possible. And with that, I will turn it back to, I don't know, Judith or Greg to open it up for questions. Yes, I will just stop sharing here and ask all of the panelists to come back on camera if you were off. Uh, thank you all for those great presentations. And we also have Dr. Rita Hamad with us for the Q&A, another member of this um, incredible committee that did this this great work on intergenerational poverty. And Rita, actually, I would like to start with you. Several of the questions that we received reflect a, a really broad interest in direct financial interventions as a means to address systemic poverty. And these might include things like universal basic income, wealth-based transfers such as baby bonds or reparations, and cash transfers associated with the recent pandemic. Can you discuss what evidence, if any, the committee found that those efforts might be effective? Yeah, of course. Um, those were definitely in the list of interventions that we initially considered and looked for evidence on. Um, this a little bit goes back to Greg's comments at the beginning about the uh, criteria we set for inclusion of evidence in the report. Um, and, and part of the challenge here was just that there have not been that many studies done looking at the effects of, of all of the types of programs you just mentioned on intergenerational poverty. Um, and that even, even trying to find sort of more intermediate outcomes that would, that would um, fit our criteria for indirect evidence uh, was a bit uh, challenging or, you know, in many cases it was non-existent. Um, so, you know, again, going back to how Greg framed it initially, it doesn't mean that these programs don't have evidence. We just don't have evidence yet. And so we couldn't include them here. And so that's definitely, you know, in the, you know, at the end of the report, we didn't really talk about it in the presentation, um, but there were areas of future research needs. And I'd say those definitely fall in, in that bucket um, where we need more evidence to be able to, to speak more to the potential of those programs to reduce intergenerational poverty. Thank you so much for that. 
A number of questions also asked about interventions tailored to specific groups, especially immigrants, first generation students, and single parent female led households. Mary, you already talked about programs in particular that benefit black families and some possible interventions for Native American families. What about these other groups that, that also face some additional challenges? Yeah, I'm going to sound a little bit like Rita in my answer here in that, um, you know, the, the standard of evidence were was not only long term, which I've already mentioned, and direct, but also experimental, quasi experimental, perhaps, you know, for those of you who are the um, methods nerds out there, perhaps regression discontinuity analyses or something along those lines. And you know, there are a few of those studies. And once you get to that level of um, of uh, sophistication, very few of those studies are really focusing on effects for the subgroups. So we don't really have, a, you know, a lot of, dis we don't have any uh, discussion of kind of specific interventions, policies and programs for these groups. But I will say, I think we can kind of think in two ways. One is that Given the um, figure that Michael showed about the disproportionate poverty among families that are headed by single parents, then we might expect that the kinds of policies and programs that we put forward here very much will disproportionately positively impact um, single parent families. Um, the same for first generation college students. So here, for example, I'll just talk about one of our interventions, which is college tutoring and other kinds of student services that uh, increase retention and completion. So we can imagine these kinds of things while they haven't been studied specifically for first-gen students. Um, there are programs that we discuss explicitly in the report, like the AmeriCorps tutoring program has been successful in proving low-income uh, low student outcomes at younger ages. And a range of support programs for low-income students in community colleges, like the Accelerated Study and Associates Program, which is called ASAP, or the Stay the Course Program. Um, these have all been shown to be successful in rating student, raising students' persistence in college and completing college. So while they were focused on low-income students and not necessarily first-gen students, you know, given that you can imagine there's some overlap there, I think some of that evidence is very subject, su suggestive for the populations that the questioner asked about. Thank you for that. And we did just get kind of a follow up to that, asking whether rural poverty or rural intergenerational poverty was an element to the research and to the report. Well, it is to the extent it, there's good research on rural poverty, as people who uh, are interested in rural issues know, it's, it's very much a neglected uh, area in the general poverty research area. So um, there's really, you know, we tried to be comprehensive in looking at the, the literature, but there just uh, aren't that many um, studies that focus on rural poverty, and there aren't that many interventions uh, that are conducted in uh, rural areas. So uh, we're a little bit stuck on that by the nature of the, uh, the evidence. Thank you for that. And Greg, while we have you unmuted, I'm going to direct this question to you from the uh, live chat, which just jumped on me. Here we go. The EITC recommendation says possibly include families with no earnings. In the child tax credit debate, some policymakers push back on full refundability, choosing to reward work, not recognize child need. Yet our research shows that a quarter of babies in poverty have no parent connected to the workforce. Can you comment on the importance of economic resources in early childhood and desirability of providing such resources to families with little or no earnings? Um, I can. Let me turn to my colleague, Michael Strain, who uh, studies this extensively. And I will just say it said that you wanted to answer it live, which is <laughs> which is why I directed it to you. But Michael, I'm happy to have you take that one. Um, I think I think that there's a, you know, a robust debate about this. Um, and there's concern, uh, as the questioner mentioned, among some in the in the in the policy debate and in the political debate about um, uh, about uh, refundable tax credits to to non-working um, to non-working parents. I think you can I think you can do both, um, which is uh, 
kind of one of the options we described for the EITC in the report, um, you can give uh, a credit to um, non-working parents and have that credit phase in with the first dollar of income. So you preserve the uh, structure of the EITC uh, that that increases employment. Um, that's what that's what the, the 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 positive employment effects from the EITC come from that phase in. Um, and so if that phase in is there, you should be increasing employment. Uh, but if you but you can you can you can do that while still offering something to um, to non-working uh, to non-working parents. Um, and so this is this is not full refundability because they're not they wouldn't be they wouldn't be able to access the full the full value of the maximum credit. Uh, but uh, you, know, you can I think you can have a lot of the uh, you know positive effects of additional resources um, uh, while still preserving the employment incentive that's that's embedded in the EITC's current structure. You have to pay for it, um, which is not really something that we that we got into in the in the report. Uh, a structure that I like the one I just described is is considerably more expensive than than current law, but that's you know that's I think that's outside the scope of the report. So Judith, I might just mention um, the first uh, Q and A questions. Uh, there was a little defect and we couldn't answer them online, and it appears that uh, we said that we'd answer them live. Um, so we'll try to answer as many as we can. Okay. Um, as I understand it, we'll be able to see what those questions are and who sent them. Yes. So after yes. the uh, webinar, we'll be able to try to answer as many of those as possible. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Michael, if it's okay, we'll stay with you. The report concentrates on federal programs and policies. What lessons from the report might be most helpful for state or local policymakers to consider in trying to address intergenerational poverty on, on kind of that front line? Um, well, a lot of the evidence comes from state uh, intervention. So we were just talking about the EITC, for example. A lot of the evidence we have on the EITC comes from uh, variation in the size of the maximum credit or in other features of the credit across states. Uh, roughly half the states supplement the federal EITC. Uh, uh, a lot of the uh, discussion in the report we have about education, particularly K through 12 education, is obviously you know very focused on on uh, state and local governments, um, and that's similarly true for some of the some of the uh, policies on health and policies on policing. Um, uh, and so there's I think there's there's quite a bit in there both in terms of uh, uh, state policies that contribute to our evidence base and also a direct discussion of, of state and local policies. You did say, and, and I don't think anyone would disagree, that policies and programs cost money and there has to be investment. Is there a sense at the federal level or say at a state level or maybe at a partnership level, you know, where the money might be best spent if we want to see clear clear movement in the right direction on intergenerational poverty just a small question for you are you is that directed to me um if if you'd like it to be i no i don't think that there is consensus <laughs> i can answer i can answer that that quite quickly uh you know my own view is that um the evidence uh that um policies designed to support self-sufficiency uh, seem to be particularly successful. Um, and I would define that broadly. Uh, uh, I also, I also think that the, the policies that invest in, in, in kids when they're kids, uh, seem to be increasingly, uh, uh, demonstrating, uh, important longer term effects. And those are two, those are two kind of big buckets. And there's obviously a lot of disagreement, about whether those are the the correct buckets and 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 then kind of within those two, uh, what the what the best policies are. Anyone else like to address yeah, that? I'm going to just say a couple of things. First of all, as I look over these questions, um, a lot of them are addressed in the report, and you know we really tried to make the report readable. Uh, we have a relatively short uh, main body of the report and then a big, big appendix with all the details. Um, I don't think any of the reviewers said it read like a novel, but I think it reads 
fairly well, uh, and it directs you to all the kind of studies that people are asking about. So it's free online, and I would encourage you to uh, to take a look at the chapters that are of uh, greatest interest to you. I might also say um, we, um, we've been talking about recommendations, uh, and the committee really didn't make any formal recommendations. Recommendations have to be agreed upon by every single committee member, uh, and our committee was too diverse uh, to think that everyone could agree on every single recommendation that we had. So in thinking about these program and policy ideas, uh, what we reached consensus on is that this set of programs and policies met the evidence standard and are worthy of consideration by uh, policymakers, uh, both at the federal and, and state and local levels. So uh, the evidence is there uh, and, uh, and it's up to the political process really to decide uh, how much money to spend and whether to spend on these things. Just a final comment. Um, if you think about all the different areas that we uh, investigated, um, there are many, many different domains that uh, cause intergenerational poverty. And I think um, you could think about our ideas for programs and policies uh, as not identifying any single policy that's kind of the, the silver bullet, but uh, rather, you know, we did identify 20 different uh, programs and policies across all these areas um, that had been proven to be effective. So the strategy I think we should be thinking about isn't to concentrate on just one of these areas, but rather uh, think about a, a broader set of investments. Our, our ideas are, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to say low cost. Uh, they're, certainly, they're not zero cost. Uh, but they're uh, they're not uh, extremely expensive, uh, and to put in place a portfolio of these ideas, uh, we believe, given the evidence, would uh, make a dent in intergenerational poverty. Thank you for that. Uh, we had a question submitted before the webinar. There are many ways to measure or understand poverty, income-based, multidimensional, relative, et cetera. To what extent do these different concepts change the way we understand the intergenerational association between children and parents? I don't know who would like to take that. I could take it. Oops, sorry. Worried, we worry about this. Um, and worried that uh, well, poverty is defined in different ways. Um, data were available. If you think about the initial data that I showed, that was not using a poverty standard. It was using a low income standard at 20% uh, cutoff in the income distribution. So there's absolute poverty and relative poverty. Um, we have an appendix uh, that uh, summarizes research uh, more generally on intergenerational mobility using different kinds of uh, concepts of well-being. Uh, income, certainly. Uh, consumption uh, was another. Uh, wealth is another. Um, these are um, looks at the, the panel study of income dynamics data. Uh, and what you see is that patterns of general patterns of economic mobility uh, are very similar across the different uh, ways of thinking about the income or resources concept. Um, so that was uh, encouraging to us, um, but obviously the issue of what's the best way to measure poverty and mobility uh, will persist, at least in academia. Would anyone else like to comment on that? All right, we also had a question, um, and I think Greg, maybe this is in, in your alley, but anyone else can respond as well. Early childhood programs are absent from your list of effective education interventions. Many people really believe that early childhood program investments are among the most profitable investments that government can make. What would you say to that? I, I would say yes, people do believe that. Uh, and we spent a lot of time in this report um, sifting through the evidence. It's undeniable that there are examples, uh, Perry Preschool, for example, the Abyssidarian program uh, that were conducted back in the 60s and 70s run by researchers, neither had more than 60 uh, children in the programs um, that produced long-term 
impact, big long-term impacts. Um, so how to think about that, where these aren't scaled up programs, they took place in a setting where the safety net was much worse, family sizes were bigger and so forth. Um, how to think about the lessons of that for modern day uh, early childhood uh, programs. Um, we decided to concentrate on much more recent evidence. Uh, and there are four uh, really good studies. There are uh, clinical trials. There are uh, entire programs, scaled up programs. Uh, two are from Boston, uh, which shows some promising evidence of intergenerational uh, improvement. Uh, but then there's the Tennessee uh, pre-K e experiment, um, again, for um, the entire state of Tennessee, that shows, if anything, by sixth grade, uh, the kids who attended Tennessee pre-K did worse, considerably worse, than the kids who uh, were randomized or lost the lottery to attend the uh, program. Uh, and then there's the Head Start Impact Study, which uh, shows um, initial gains, uh, very short run initial gains by first grade and certainly by third grade, there are just no differences uh, between the Head Start group and the comparison group uh, across a, um, a variety of measures of both academic achievement and socio-emotional functioning. So the question that we thought about was to what extent can we make recommendations or come up with ideas for spending incremental money that the, let's say the federal government had $5 billion or $10 billion to spend on early childhood, um, given the evidence, which is quite mixed, we were not uh, comfortable uh, recommending that that money be spent on Head Start, that that money be spent on uh, pre-K programs, or that that money be spent on uh, broader childcare assistance for low-income families, which is another uh, very strong need um, that, uh, that we could spend that money on. So in terms of the early childhood education programs, we just were not comfortable making a recommendation about where that incremental money would be uh, would be effective. Thank you. We have just another minute or two, and I just want to give uh, the four members of the committee that we have with us a chance for any kind of closing thoughts that you'd like to share. And Rita, would you like to start? Back to me. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to Mary. Um, so my closing thought actually is about another program and policy. So this this evidence, um, we have strong evidence that has multiple programs uh, and policies across the country that's kind of been replicated. But there was one uh, study that I just will highlight, and that's about the positive impacts of ethnic studies on high school students, um, short term outcomes for sure, and then perhaps also into college matriculation. And I only name that because we are in a in a moment now when, of course, ethnic studies is under attack. I'm the chair of the Black Studies Department at, at Northwestern University, so I feel it's important for me to mention this. And so as we think about intergenerational poverty or kids' upward mobility or kids' success in schools, um, this is, I think, an, a different way to think about these kind of curricula. And that is a topic that Jesse Rothstein and I touched on in the podcast interview, which there is a link in the chat. Um, Michael, would you like to share any closing thoughts? Um, I, you know, I, I think I think the thought that comes to mind for me is uh, just how difficult it is um, to uh, really better understand intergenerational uh, poverty, intergenerational mobility out of poverty. It's such a complicated issue. You know, people people live their lives and kind of enmeshed in a you know in a, in a web of institutions and relationships and and uh, you know scholars study things in silos and in departments and study programs often in isolation and uh, you know if you really want to nail your understanding of one thing you know then 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 kind of by definition you're 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 not taking into account that broader that 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 broader mosaic in which people live. Similarly, it's really really difficult to un, to understand what to do about this um, and how to and how to change public policy to improve it. And I think that that shouldn't that shouldn't discourage 
uh, scholars. It shouldn't discourage people who 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 work in low income communities. Um, but it should be a call to action for uh, more resources to understand these issues and and uh, and you know even more work to try and try and lift people out of poverty. Thank you for that, Rita. Sorry about earlier. No, sorry, sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think one of the things I noticed is that uh, we have some attendees of the seminar who are, you know, at our federal and state and local agencies. And, you know, coming back to the one of the last parts of the report was how can we move forward to get more evidence on all of these um, policies and programs that we don't have enough evidence on. Um, and, you know, one thing we noted what were the data challenges that in a lot of cases, these data sets are hard to get access to. They're hard to link with one another because of um, legal and administrative and, and logistic challenges. So just encouraging folks who work in that space, either, um, again, the federal or local governments, um, to to take those steps and for people in the you know research and and programmatic space to to lobby for those sorts of um, in increases to data availability so that we can get the evidence we need to make uh, to make more recommendations on on this other slate of policies that we just weren't able to speak to as well. Thank you for that. And Greg will give you the last word. And I want to thank Greg especially for putting together this great panel and bringing it to us to, at IRP for this webinar. Right. Yeah, well, thank you for delivering such a large audience. We, uh, we appreciate that. Um, I just want to be thankful, <laughs> you know, at this putting the uh, these panels together and having them hash things out uh, is just a, a, a big task, and it really requires a lot of dedication and goodwill on the part of members. Um, they did not see eye to eye at the beginning. Uh, they didn't completely see eye to eye at the end, but uh, somehow we managed to get a report out uh, and that's because everyone, like people on the panel and other committee members, work very hard. So I want to end up really expressing a, a vote of thanks and appreciation to uh, committee members, uh, including the people who are on the webinar today. Thank you. Well, and I will add to that thanks and say thank you so much to NAS committee members Greg Duncan, Michael Strain, Mary Patillo, and Rita Hamad for sharing their time, experience, and research with us today, and to Natea Taylor for handling the web webinar tech. As we mentioned before, we'll be posting the slides and the recording of the webinar within a day or so, and you'll receive a link to those by email if you registered for the webinar. Thank you all for joining us, and have a great rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>